Hello everybody, Kendrick Scott and I am with the Triangle North Carolina Gun Club and today we are going to be talking about my favorite toys, Glocks and Glock barrel swapping. Um, before we go any further, I just want to let you know that this is our first uh, engagement under our new name, Triangle North Carolina Gun Club. We are still, as we spoke before, a NAGA-affiliated chapter. We are serving the Triangle area, as the name uh, kind of denotes, and we are still the home uh, gun club of Eagle One. So that being said, I want to go ahead and get started today. And, and the reason that we're here doing this, obviously, is because of the COVID 19 virus has kind of kept us away from Eagle One and, and having our in-person chapter meetings, but we've been getting a lot of calls for different things. And one of the things that we get uh, questioned a lot about, unless I definitely take a lot of questions for, are they've this Glock barrel swapping thing. How does that work? And, and it's just something that I think um, it's better to show you than to try and explain it to you with either a picture or just talking. So. Uh, we're going to try and bring this to you today. It'll be the first of two classes that we're going to offer. Our second one's going to be to talk about some uh, AR-15 pistols that we get asked about a lot as well. But right now, we're going to talk about uh, Glocks and barrels. Um, so first, let's go with some quick safety rules is that we do everything with um, the Triangle North Carolina Gun Club. Safety, safety, safety is so important and paramount. So. Um, I want you to know that everything that you see that I'm going to be holding up here has already been uh, safety checked. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and just quick, quick review of what those safety rules are. Remember, muzzle always pointed in a safe direction. Never pointed at something you don't intend to destroy. Always keep your finger off of the trigger until you are ready to shoot. Know your target and what is beyond it. And lastly is whenever a firearm falls, do not try to catch one of these. If it's falling, it's safer to let it hit the ground than for you to try and grab it and hold it by accidentally letting your finger slip in here and cause an accidental discharge. Um, so again, all of these have been checked. Um, you're gonna see them all locked open. Um, and I may close one from time to time, but we're gonna go ahead and get into the meat of what we wanna talk about. So. Glock barrel swaps, why would we want to do that? In short, to save some money. Um, what I'm going to show you is how you can take and buy one pistol and shoot three different types of bullets through the same gun instead of buying three different pistols. Um, so let's get started. This is a Glock 19 9mm. Um, the three bullets that we're going to talk about today are going to be the 19 9 mm chambered. This is a 26. This is also a 9 mm. And this is a Glock 32 and 357 SIG. And this is going to be our hybrid model firearm today. So, what we can do is with one, and this will work on just about any Glock. Um, and I'm sure it probably works on some other cal other uh, brands of firearms. Um, my experience is using this with the Glock uh, brand, so that's why I'm going to go over it. But you know, you, you'll probably have to just do your own research to find out if SIG or HK or Smith & Wesson or any of these other companies um, are this modular. Uh, so let's start with this. This, as purchased, is a Glock 32 chambered in 357 SIG, not to be confused with 357 Magnum. This is the 357 SIG bullet. As it comes, it's shot out of this, this pistol. So what we can do is if we take this gun apart, we are going to see in here the 357 SIG barrel, which again, 357 SIG bullet comes out of. I can take this barrel, put it aside, and pick up, this one is my 40 caliber Smith & Wesson barrel, 40 caliber bullet, and this is a Storm Lake brand um, barrel. You just saw me take it out of one, and I'm gonna stick that 40 caliber barrel in the same slide assembly. And now, you see this is now turned into a Glock 23, which is a 40 caliber pistol. Um, the 40 caliber bullet 
and the 357 SIG bullet share the same case or, or diameter to the bottom of the case, I guess is a better way to explain it, which is how they're able to cycle. And the other interesting thing, magazines are the exact same. So if I take my 40 caliber bullet, and this is a 357 SIG magazine that came with this gun, as you can see, I can load it in here. I can take it out. This is a Glock 23 40 caliber magazine. And of course, the 40 caliber bullet fits in it. I can also take that same 357 SIG bullet and this 40 caliber magazine, and it also fits in it. So that now I've shot 357 SIG, my barrel out, and replaced it with a 40 caliber Smith & Wesson barrel um, in here. Now I can even change again and go from here and get my barrels and magazines together here. This is a nine millimeter conversion barrel for the Glock 32 or 23. Um, it is a Lone Wolf um, stainless steel barrel. So I'll take that barrel, drop it in here. Same gun, same frame, same slide. Now the third different barrel that I've put in here and we went from running 357 SIG, 40 Smith & Wesson, nine millimeter one gun three different bullets so the question sometimes i get when i tell folks i do this all the time is how does that really how does that work or how are how are those things able to be that modular so the the thing is get my this is the original one we picked up the glock 19 nine millimeter so the way that this actually is working is you can once a nine always a nine that being that meaning that once you purchase a nine millimeter slide it can never be anything else because the hole will always be too small to fit the larger diameter 40 caliber bullet through it however you can take a 40 caliber gun because the hole is larger. And now all I need to do is put more barrel in here. So if you look at, I'll try and see if the camera will capture this. In my right hand, this is the nine millimeter barrel. And here is, this is the 40 caliber barrel. So you can see that there's actually more barrel filling in that larger hole to allow a smaller bullet to come out. Here is the same, just hollowed out some more to allow for a larger bullet. To note also, you'll probably see the chambering is a little different because the calibers are a little different. Um, and the 357 SIG barrel Again, if you look at them up close, this is the 357 SIG, this is the 9mm. You'll see that the 9mm is a thicker barrel to make a smaller hole to allow for the smaller 9mm bullet to pass through it. Um, what I do do, uh, mostly for safety for me, because once you start moving around all these different calibers and barrels, I typically don't keep the barrels with me, I'll pick one barrel and one ammo and shoot them. I try not to keep them all together. And the other thing I do, especially when I'm going between the 40 caliber and the 357 SIG caliber, I have the magazines again are the exact same. But what I do just to keep my head straight and remind me is I put a bumper pad on the bottom of my 357 SIG magazine so I know if I see that red on the bottom of the magazine, I need to be using the 357 SIG bullet out of it. I never ever use this red bottom magazine 
with a 40 caliber bullet coming through it because if I see that red, I know that I'm then using the 357 caliber barrel in the gun. Um, whenever I use the black bottom magazines, I typically will know that it's gonna be the nine or the 40. One thing to important note, when you do change into your nine millimeter version, you have to use a Glock 19 nine millimeter magazine. You cannot take the 40 caliber magazine with the nine millimeter conversion barrel and put that in there. Um, so I keep my Glock 19 magazine handy whenever I'm dropping in that nine millimeter barrel. And again, this is my nine millimeter barrel. I can fully assemble. I use actually the same uh, guide rod. This is the original guide rod spring that came in the Glock 32 when I bought it. I don't change it. It stays in there for every barrel I put in here. We assemble. And I've basically now went from a Glock 32 to a Glock 23, and then this is basically a Glock 19 now. Um, the slide still says 32, 357 SIG, but the barrel is gonna shoot a nine millimeter. Um, if I close her up, this is a nine millimeter magazine. Fits in it, the gun will cycle just as, it, just as my 19 will. It's just a different, different look with a different barrel. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is how you can move around um, within calibers. But remember, once a nine, always a nine. You can never go and change a nine millimeter caliber pistol to anything but that nine millimeter. So if you're looking to spend less money and not run out and buy a bunch of different Glock pistols, um, instead of going out and buying three of these, you can buy one and then you're running different barrels. A barrel typically, um, Storm Lake is I think one of the better uh, aftermarket barrel makers out there. This particular 40 caliber stainless barrel ran me about $120. Um, I think the nine millimeter conversion barrel was about the same. So again, the only thing I had to do was to go out and source me some nine millimeter magazines uh, once I got the barrel. And then of course I can shoot anything. Um, quick note on the ammunition, uh, just in addition to your SIG 357 um, bullet and your nine millimeter round, you know, the SIG bullet is basically in its simplest form, a 40 caliber casing neck down with a nine millimeter bullet on top of it. Uh, this particular bullet, if I'm not mistaken, is a 125 grain spear gold dot. Um, and this nine millimeter bullet is just a 124 grain plus P spear gold dot uh, bullet. So, you know, very similar in size and weight. Uh, the only difference is you're gonna pick up a lot more velocity using this 357 SIG um, round. And so that's how they are interchanged in the Glocks. I'm quite sure that other brands um, allow some type of uh, modular ability to change out barrels. Uh, I just find that Glocks are very easy to work with um, and they were very easy just to buy the barrel and they're drop in. There's no other, um, there's no other alterations to the pistol that you have to make other than taking the barrel out and literally putting one in and remembering that if you're going from 40 or 357 SIG that you got to make sure that you get you a Glock 19 magazine. Um, and that holds true for all the Glock families. So even if you went, again, this is a 26, so once a nine, always a nine. However, if I purchased a Glock 27, you would have been able to buy a 40 caliber barrel for, well, it will come with a 40 caliber barrel. You've been able to buy the Glock 33, 357 SIG barrel, and then you could have purchased a 26 conversion barrel. And just as I did with this pistol, I would have done with this to shoot all three calibers out of one frame and one slide just by changing out uh, the barrel. So that's our quick Glock barrel swapping class. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to hit any of us up, um, us gun folk or us Glock folk, as I'd probably call us. Uh, we, we love talking about our Glock, so we'll be able to help you answer any of those questions. And um, that's it. We'll see you in our next class.
All right, well, welcome everybody. This is our uh, second engagement of our new Triangle North Carolina Gun Club chapter here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And we are still a NAGA chapter, and we are still the home gun club for Eagle One Gun Range in Raleigh. So we talked a little bit about um, Glock barrel swapping a minute ago, and now we're going to move into our second engagement, which is going to be to talk about the AR pistol. Uh, again, this is one of those things where we've gotten as a chapter a lot of questions about, um, seeing a lot of new people coming into the fold that are asking questions about them. And I see a lot of people purchasing them when we're on the, our Facebook page. So as the chapter leadership team decided that this is one of those things we want to go ahead and try and get some information out there to uh, keep our people informed because again, education is what we're about, folks. So let's get started. Um, as with any presentation that happens around the firearm world, there's a lot of disclaimers that have to precede whatever we talk about, and that's no different for this one. So um, here are the disclaimers for this one. This presentation is for information purposes only. Um, any information that you hear should be validated and researched before building, buying, or modifying any type of firearm. Uh, myself, NAGA, and the North Carolina Triangle chapter uh, we are not responsible for any information contained in this presentation we do think that you need to refer to the atf for any definitions explanations uh, applications of rules or laws uh, as with any firearm uh, make sure you know the laws governing that purchase and what you're buying um, and it's very very tricky as you're about to hear with the sbr versus the ar pistol uh, and as always, also, attendees should not be handling any firearms at the time that we do this presentation. All right, folks, so those are all our legal disclaimers we need to get out of the way. Um, one more housekeeping item is we'd like to make sure we start any th engagement off with some safety rules, and so these are the safety rules we want to give you for today. So make sure you treat every firearm as if it's loaded. Um, you, know, you never know when someone is handing you a gun, cleared it or not. So when they hand it to you, you wanna make sure you treat it as if it were loaded and check to make sure it's clear. Make sure you know where that muzzle awareness is. Um, pointing guns at folks is not uh, range etiquette or, or any type of firearm etiquette that we're endorsing. Um, you wanna make sure that the muzzle is always pointing in a safe direction, whether it's down range or down at the ground, but never pointing at anything that you do not intend to destroy. Keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. A lot of um, accidents happen as people are talking and handling firearms and letting their finger slip onto that trigger. Um, so make sure that you have good trigger awareness. Uh, and know your target and what's beyond it. Bullets don't stop until something makes them stop. Uh, no matter what, where you're aiming at, uh, just keep in mind that if you miss, that bullet's gonna keep traveling. And um, if you're shooting in the paper, for sure, the bullet's gonna continue on beyond it. So know what's behind your target. And lastly, never catch a falling firearm. Uh, a gun is safer to drop and hit the ground than it is for you to try and, and bumble and catch and put your hands around something that's falling. Uh, again, that's a way that your finger slips in the trigger and you, uh, you have an accidental discharge. So safety, 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 we always preach it. Education and safety go hand in hand and this is our way of saying, please be safe once you start playing with these firearms. And um, with that, let's go ahead and get started into our lesson for today. So we're gonna talk about the AR pistol. Um, let's do a quick introduction to it. Uh, the SBR versus the AR pistol, uh, because that's really, this isn't a class of necessarily talk about the AR platform itself, but so much so about the, the variant of the SBR versus the AR pistol. So what is an AR pistol? It's a relatively new, um, but very popular variant of the AR-15 rifle. Um, but there are some very distinct differences between an AR pistol and an SBR, which is a short-barreled rifle. And we're gonna get into that and you're gonna hopefully know those um, differences by the time we get done. And again, it's very, very, very important. I cannot stress this enough to know the laws around an SBR and an AR pistol. Um, simply possessing one um, can lead to a felony if you are not um, building or purchasing what you know that you're buying. Uh, some folks buy these AR pistols and turn them into things that they never should be. But we're gonna go over all that um, in this presentation. So the short-barreled rifle, 
what is an SBR? People hear about that term all the time. It's a highly regulated um, item. It's a felony to possess one without going through the proper uh, process to get it. The wait time for one is right now, it's probably running eight or nine months. Um, I anticipate that will probably be longer as we get closer to the election season. Uh, it can be thought of kind of as your smaller version of an M4, which is your regular civilian use um, AR-15 platform. Uh, SBRs typically have or always have a barrel that's going to be under 16 inches. Now keep in mind, I'm going to throw a lot of numbers at you. Um, one of those important ones is the 16 inch barrel length limit. Uh, the legal limit for a rifle in this country is 16 inches and longer. Once you get a barrel of anything, of anything that's less than 16 inches is when um, you're going to be getting into some areas where you want to make sure you understand exactly what you're buying. Um, and they're mainly used for self-defense. And uh, again, an SBR is not to be confused with an AR pistol. And we're going to get into um, those differences here in a second. As you can see on this picture here, we have several different uh, AR platforms. There's a pistol up here, you see the SBR, you see the M16, you see an M4. Um, a lot of numbers, a lot of letters, a lot of acronyms. Uh, again, we're gonna try and get into and explain all that for you today. So you, at the end of this presentation, hopefully you're gonna know the differences between all of these really by just looking at them and not having to have someone explain to you what's in that particular rifle. Um, so what are our learning objectives for today? Uh, we're gonna cover the AR-15 uh, terminology that relates to M16s, M4s, your AR pistol, your SBR. So you're gonna get all those acronyms straight. Uh, we're gonna talk about AR pistol builds, um, pros and cons of those. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about barrel lengths because when you get into the AR platform and you start shortening that barrel down, um, it does a lot of different things to the bullet velocity, so we want to make sure that you understand that when you go to build one of these things or buy one. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about components, uh, setups, how people build them, what they put in them, uh, some product stuff, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end. Um, so let's get started first with our AR-15 pistol terminology. Um, so the definition of an AR pistol, the actual ATF definition is very complex and always changing. Uh, so it's recommended that you go to the ATF website to understand and read the definition of what an AR pistol is. It is very complicated. Um, but you need to know that definition and the ramifications for not knowing that definition when you go to put together an AR pistol. Um, AR pistols are not governed by the NFA or the National Firearms Act, and you're going to hear that NFA term quite a bit as we talk about an SBR, short barreled rifle, versus an AR pistol and how those two things are uh, related to the NFA. AR pistols generally have a barrel of less than 16 inches, because remember when we first talked about a few minutes ago, the legal length of a rifle is 16 inches or longer, so when you go lower than 16 inches is when you're looking at a pistol or an SBR. Um, rifles generally are going to have that 16 inch barrel or longer, 18, 24 inches. Um, all of your hunting guns are typically going to be longer than a 16 inch barrel. Um, and also one other thing I want to make sure I do let you do know of is the presentation we're going to do today as we start to get into it is really for that novice person or those beginners that are trying to get their hands on their first AR-15 pistol or they're contemplating on going down the road of building an SBR. Um, we're not going to go into the really high-end barrel twist rates and all those things. So keep that in mind as you're going uh, listening to this presentation is it, the audience that we really want to speak to right now are you folks that are thinking about buying an AR pistol or are possibly getting ready to do an SBR. So type of AR platform, some more numbers and acronyms. An M16, what is that? So the M16 is the original, quote, AR-15 rifle. It's, uh, it's a military weapon. It has a typically a full auto rate of fire. Its original design was a 20 inch barrel with a fixed stock on the back of it. So that's your garden variety, if you will, M16. Your M4, is going to be that same rifle but with a shorter barrel 16 inches and we're going to add 
a telescoping or collapsible stock and take away that fixed stock that the M16 had. So basically what you're doing is you're shortening that package down to a smaller rifle. An SBR is a platform for the AR where below 16 inches is the barrel now and it still retains that collapsible stock. So we're collapsible stock, shorter barrel. Those guns are regulated by the National Firearms Act or the NFA. The AR pistol is nothing more than a smaller M4. Okay, so we're going shorter barrel than 16 inches, but it's that the rear part, the buttstock, that's going to change. And we're going to show you a little bit about what that really looks like in a minute. Um, the vertical foregrip, and these are things that are, are, are you, you need to know these terminology because it's going to apply to, and you're going to understand them when you see pictures of these different types of, um, of rifles and pistols and SBR variants. So the vertical foregrip, that's generally an attachment that is put on a rifle that's in front of the trigger. And as its name denotes, it's a vertical foregrip, 90 degrees. It's just straight up and down in front of the trigger. And it kind of makes the weapon so that you have to use two hands to shoot it. Um, keep in mind, pistol designed to be shot with one hand, but anytime you add that vertical foregrip, you're now saying that that weapon is to be shot with two hands and not one, which is a rifle characteristic. There is such a thing called a 45 degree foregrip, which you're gonna see a picture of, but just think foregrip that's bent backwards. That is not a 90 degrees, it's a 45 degree slanted foregrip. Um, a stock is an essential part of a rifle. Um, you do not have stocks on pistols. And as we see some pictures here shortly, you're gonna understand why I say that. The pistol brace though, is what you do find on a pistol. And that is nothing more than a stabilizing brace that enables you to fire an AR pistol in a more controlled manner. We do need to know a little bit about powder burn rates, but I don't wanna go really deep into that because again, I'm trying to keep this to that entry and novice level person. The powder burn rate, just think of the amount of gunpowder that's in a bullet. That powder burns, creates pressure, which pushes the bullet down the rifle barrel and out the end of the muzzle. Um, it's important to know that when we start talking about shortening down the uh, AR-15 platform. Length of pull, these are probably two really, maybe I would say a little bit higher level things that we're gonna go ahead and cover. Um, but just bear with me because I think it is important that you know that. The length of pull, so the ATF has advised that a length of pull that exceeds 13.5 inches may, may constitute a redesign of a pistol brace and turn it into a stock. That's very important because of the definition of a rifle characteristic versus a pistol. The overall length, which is measured from the muzzle minus any type of muzzle brake you have, so from there to the rear of a a pistol brace in its shortest form is what the overall length measurement encompasses. And that's important because once that length is below 26 inches, that is called an any other weapon in the National Firearm Act or AOW. And those require a tax stamp and those are a registered NFA item. Okay, so I think that's enough for terminology and vocabulary. So let's let's take a look now at what measuring AOL or overall length and length of pull really mean. So on the left, what you're seeing is a what's called an any other weapon because that length is under the 26 inches I just mentioned. Um, and on the right, what you're seeing is an example of the length of pull that's measured from the center of the trigger back to the back of the stock of a rifle. And that helps you kind of gauge your sizing on a rifle. Um, now let's move into the AR pistol pros and cons. This is kind of um, my opinion um, of how I kind of see the AR pistol. And keep in mind, as with anything that's firearm related, a lot of things are gonna be opinion based and personal preferences. Um, I'm gonna give you the best of my knowledge and my opinion on the AR pistol with this pro and con section. So what are pros of the AR pistol? Well, it's, it's shorter in length, 
which means it's easier to maneuver, like in and out of a vehicle. Um, you're typically going to see a lot of law enforcement folks that love these things because they can get in and out of a car with it much easier, and transporting it is a lot easier. Um, it's lighter in weight. It's less gun, so it weighs less. Um, it's just as modular, though, as your M4. Anything that you put on your standard M4 that you have at home, um, you can put those same components, for the most part, on your AR pistol or your SBR. Most specifically, we're talking about component-wise, your optics, your backup sights, lights, that type of thing. Um, they're a lot of fun to shoot. I mean, they are a hoot because they're they're a lot lighter than your bigger rifle. Um, they're more mobile, as we said before. They come in multiple calibers. You can shoot several different things out of AR pistols. Um, I've seen folks that make them with 308 caliber, um, a very popular 300 blackout caliber, and then of course your 556 or 223. Um, they can be made into a rifle at any time. So if you have an AR pistol and you don't really like it, you purchased it and it was registered and transferred to you as an AR pistol, you can always put a 16 or longer inch barrel upper on top of a pistol lower and turn it into a rifle at any time. Um, and it falls under your concealed carry permit. So it's a pistol just like any other handgun. It's an AR pistol, so it falls under your concealed carry permit. Now, for some cons, some of the things that I would see as a con to the AR pistol. Um, you gotta be really careful with when you build these. You really need to know the law and know the rules around AR pistols and SBRs and the differences of those two things. And if you don't know that or you're not taking the time to learn that, well, you are because you're tuning into our presentation. Um, but people that, that build these and don't know that can run afoul of the NFA. And again, as I said before, it's a felony if you get caught with one of those. Um, bullet performance. And this is a subjective, but it is what it is. I'm going to try to explain it uh, best I can. Um, and we're going to have a, a little bit more description to it in just a second. But every time you shorten a barrel on an AR-15 platform gun, you are losing velocity off the bullet. And that goes back to talking about that powder burn rate that we discussed. Um, and I'll get a little bit more detail on that in just a second. Uh, so you have some low light issues with um, some of these AR pistols. I've seen uh, folks that have made them as short as seven, seven and a half inch barrel on them. Um, you shoot that in a low light situation, you're gonna have a muzzle flash that's gonna blind you. Um, they're great for self-defense, but they're extremely loud because you are, again, you're, you're bringing that muzzle blast that much closer to your ears by shortening the barrel and they are very loud. Um, even with a suppressor, your 5.56 and 223 is not gonna be um, quiet to where you can shoot it without ear protection on. Um, and, as I talked about before, if you start out with an AR pistol lower, um, it, it's pretty much going to stay a pistol until you can convert it into that longer rifle. But if you buy a rifle lower, that always will be a rifle. You cannot convert that to a pistol by the letter of the law. So let's look a little bit now about these uh, pistols and barrel links. We're going to talk about that as the one of the cons I had. So what you see here now in front of you is a, a chart that um, is going to take, well, I want you to really look at are those first two columns on this chart, the barrel length in inches and the muzzle velocity in feet per second. So what this chart is showing you is the velocity of a 223 55 grain full metal jacket bullet from a 26 inch barrel and the speed that that bullet's coming out at the muzzle all the way down to a six inch barrel and what that velocity is doing. So it's, let's take a standard M16, which is the original one we talked about, right? The 20 inch barrel fixed stock military rifle. Uh, if you look at the chart, you're gonna find that that bullet comes out of the gun at 3,071 feet per second, very fast. Um, so when you take that M16 with a 20 inch barrel and now we bring it down by four inches to a 16 and a half inch barrel, well, it's, you know, little three and a half inches, um, you see that the velocity is going to drop from 3,071 feet per second down to 2,968 feet per second. So what I mentioned before is every time you're shortening that barrel, you're losing velocity on the bullet, i.e. you're making it less effective. Um, Let's take the M4 16 and a half inch and bring it down 
you know, four and a half more inches to a 10 inch barrel. Now you see the velocity at 2,489 feet per second. Um, and if we go even two more inches down to an eight inch barrel, you're looking at 2,296 feet per second. So we went from 3,071 feet per second by shortening that barrel from 20 inches down to eight inch barrel, you're now talking down to 2,296 feet per second. Now, in the grand scheme of things, someone, uh, target's getting hit with that, you know, they're not gonna know the difference. But the performance of the bullet is a whole different thing. Um, you are losing about 16% velocity on the round just going from your your M4 to a 10 inch, so a 16 inch barrel to a 10 inch barrel. And then when you go from that M4 all the way down to that eight inch, you're losing almost a quarter of the velocity of the round, 23% um, roughly, uh, by cutting that barrel down. So one of the cons, and, and again, this is just in my opinion, is that with a 5.56 round, the, the purpose of it is all of that velocity is behind it. Well, you're defeating that every time you start chopping the barrel down. Again, it's not to say that you're, you have an uh, ineffective weapon, you have a less effective round is what you wind up with. Because again, you are, um, the powder burn rate that we talked about before, that bullet has burnt up all of its powder and created all the pressure it needs to achieve its maximum velocity in 20 inches of barrel. When you start cutting that down and shortening it, what you end up doing is the bullet is leaving the gun before all the powder is burned up and all the pressure has been created to push the bullet as fast as it's really built to go and you wind up with a slower bullet because it's leaving the barrel with gunpowder basically still burning in the barrel and that's that big flash of pressure you see coming out of the end of the gun. Um, all of that is wasted energy where if you have the longer barrel, you squeeze more velocity out of it. Keep that in mind as we talk about the 300 blackout though. Um, I think that's where we're gonna see uh, some things come back for the AR pistol, if you will. So now looking at the common calibers that you find the AR pistol, and you see here's the 5.56 or the 2.23 and that 300 blackout uh, round. As you can see by looking at them, the size of the 5.56 bullet as compared to the 300 blackout, the 300 blackout is much larger. Um, and delivers much more energy than that 5.56 will. Um, so the 300 blackout in the AR pistol configuration, this is probably the hottest thing that's out there now. This is what most people are putting these um, short uppers uh, caliber wise that they're building them into. They are great for home defense. Um, you have a much bigger bullet delivering a lot more energy into the target uh, than that little light 55 grain 5.56 bullet. It uses the same magazine as a 5.56 or 2.23 AR-15. Um, the bolt carrier group is the same because the, the parent cartridge of the 300 Blackout is the 5.56, so a lot of those components are the same. Um, really, the only difference is the barrel. Uh, you get a lot of variety with your ammunition choices because you can shoot 300 Blackout and supersonic that meaning that it's traveling faster than the speed of sound, or subsonic, that meaning that it's traveling under the speed of sound. Um, a con to the 300 Blackout, and anyone that owns one today will tell you for sure, the ammunition is impossible to find. Um, and when you can find it, it's gonna cost a lot more. Um, I would say in, in a normal market rate, you're looking at somewhere around 38, 39 cents around for 5.56 ammunition, um, just regular full metal jacket. The 300 blackout is typically around subsonic ammo is gonna run you 80 to 85 cents per round. So it's a substantial, substantial cost increase to shoot 300 blackout um, versus that 5.56. Uh, it's not something you're gonna go out and buy a thousand rounds of it um, when you see the price of it. Uh, the bullet trajectory of the two is very different. What does that mean? The 300 blackout bullet does not have the effective range. Even though the gun looks exactly like your M4, when you chamber it in 300 blackout, it does not have the reach of a 5.56 round at all. Um, some will argue that its, its effective range really is, is measured in two to three to maybe at the most 400 yards 
Um, beyond that, the 300 blackout round is losing speed and, and falling very, very fast. Um, where the 5.56, again, will give you a much greater um, distance to shoot with. Um, however, the 300 blackout, that's your suppressor round. It's what it was designed for, it's what it was made to do. Um, when you put a 220 grain um, 300 blackout bullet with a quality suppressor, it will get you pretty close to being Hollywood quiet. Um, you will not do that with a 5.56 AR pistol. Um, you can just cannot get that round under the speed of sound for it to really be truly a uh, subsonic uh, experience. So the 300 Black, a lot of stuff for it, but again, if you go that route to get your AR pistol chambered in um, 300 Blackout, just know you're gonna spend a lot of money in ammunition and you're gonna be hunting for it a lot uh, because right now it is very difficult to find. Uh, so let's talk about some common setups. Uh, just what you typically are gonna find, again, this is not all encompassing. I just grabbed a few um, pictures of AR pistols to kind of give you an idea of what they look like and what's in them. Um, typically your, your AR pistol is gonna have a red dot on it. Um, I've seen some folks put scopes on it. I'm not really sure why. Um, you don't have the you don't have the precision over long distances with a really short barrel. So to use a scope on a AR pistol, from my experience, has not been something that, that I would do. Um, your red dot optics, again, if you're looking at a home defense weapon, red dot optics are the way to go. They're much faster, um, they're much cleaner, they're much smaller, um, and they don't take as much work to, to get a zero in. Typically, most folks I see um, setting up AR pistols, they zero those at just 50 yards. Um, Again, it's a personal, it's a self-defense weapon. It's not a precision long distance shooting uh, gun. You're not gonna take a 10 inch, even in 5.56 AR pistol um, and go out and shoot at 500 yards with it, even if you use a scope. It's not what it's designed to do. Um, they're designed to shoot shorter distances. So you set the zero at a shorter distance versus a longer one. Um, there's a lot of different popular braces out there for your AR pistol. SB Tactical makes uh, a lot of the newer ones that are kind of cool. Um, the SIG was the first brace that really kind of started all of this stuff. Um, the Blade Shockwave brace was probably the, the first um, inexpensive, very quick way to get into an AR pistol. Uh, they come in fixed, adjustable, or foldable type uh, braces. And again, any modification that you do cosmetically to an M4, you can do to an AR pistol. Again, I'm talking about just your lights, your sights, your optics, slings, that type of thing. Um, and you can also put AR pistols uh, in a covert type uh, container. Like I've seen some folks stick them in uh, tennis rack carriers uh, or tennis bags because they're that small and they can fit those in that. It's not as um, overt as walking around with a rifle case. Um, but it's all about the brace, right? It's all about the pistol brace. So um, here, the main difference between an SBR and an AR pistol is what's on the back end of the gun, and that's gonna be the AR pistol brace. It's a brace. It is not, I repeat, it is not a stock. Um, it's the incorrect use of the vocabulary to call it a, a brace of stock, and uh, legally, you don't wanna be calling your AR pistol brace your stock. Um, again, it's a brace. It's aiding you shooting a uh, AR pistol. So it's a brace, not a stock. Um, they come in several types. Again, I said that they were fixed, they're adjustable, and they're folding. They've come a long way since, um, the original uh, SIG brace came out. Back then it was just a big bulky brace that was fixed on the back of a buffer tube and it stayed in its spot and that's all it was. Now there's, you know, I'm gonna show you a picture of just tons of different types of uh, braces that have come into the market. So how's it used? Um, the picture you see right now is a AR pistol brace. Um, this is the SIG brace, the very first one. Um, and how it's designed to be used is that you put your arm through it, and as you see the Velcro straps that wrap around your forearm allows you to shoot it in a one-handed fashion. Very important. Its original design was to be shot with one hand. Um, that's why when we talked in the beginning of the presentation about vertical foregrips, a vertical foregrip is a rifle characteristic which implies that the weapon is to be used with two hands. 
And if it's a rifle and it has a 10 inch barrel, it's an SBR. It cannot be an AR pistol. So that's where folks that don't understand the law and the rules behind building these things kind of run afoul of the NFA because they don't want to do that tax stamp. They don't want to do all that waiting. Um, they buy one, of, you know, take the, the pistol we're looking at now. If you put a vertical pistol brace on there, you have turned that AR pistol into an SBR or a short barreled rifle because it implies that you are going to use two hands to shoot it and a pistol requires only one hand to fire. Um, here again, if you're looking at now, some common AR pistol braces, these are, you know, as you see in the larger picture, a lot of different braces, they all meet the same thing. They're a brace, not a stock. Um, the SP Tactical, I'm sorry, SB Tactical uh, PDW brace is adjustable. It's a brace that just happens to be adjustable. Uh, you see there the SIG brace is also there. That's the original one. You can see in that picture how it's oval where you would be sticking your arm through it to use it as a brace to fire. The Shockwave blade brace, um, that's your inexpensive option for um, creating an S a AR pistol. So, um, again, make sure you know that difference between a pistol brace and an AR stock. Very different. Um, transition now to some common setups for home defense, how you're going to see these things put together. These are just some stock pictures that I found that I um, want to share with you. So what you see in this picture is a common AR pistol. It's got a 45 degree um, Magpul foregrip. It's not 90. This is your 45. Uh, you see the shockwave blade brace there. It's not a stock. It's a it's a brace. It doesn't that that particular model does not move. It's not adjustable at all. Um, they've put a Trigicon uh, ACOG optic on this particular one, and that barrel, you know, my guess is probably an eight uh, inch barrel is what it looks to be. Um, but again, what you're looking at is an AR pistol. That's not a rifle. Um, to call it one is incorrect. That's an AR pistol. This is another AR pistol. This one has the original SIG brace on the back of it. You see it's much larger, um, much shorter barrel. This is where we go back to talking about those bullet velocities. The, the velocity in this, in this particular um, AR pistol is going to be much slower than it coming out of the same bullet coming out of an M4. Uh, it's got your Magpul backup sights on it. Uh, uh, again, an optic, not a scope. Your, your short barrel, not accurate over long distance. Um, and again, it's been Cerakoted, which is just a fancy way of saying someone had it painted. So that is bringing us towards the end of our presentation for today. Uh, I do want to mention some, some websites where we can get some information. Eagle One is still our home range for the North Carolina Triangle Gun Club, and we're still a NAGA chapter. So again, it's Triangle North Carolina Gun Club, NAGA chapter, Eagle One, home range. Um, you see here all of our contact information and website stuff. Uh, we did want to take some questions real quick. Um, I had some that came in earlier that I did want to address before we let you go. Um, got one question about adjustable gas blocks, um, lightweight bolt carrier groups, and uh, as it relates to putting that in an AR pistol as it relates to sub and supersonic 300 blackout ammunition. Um, in my experience of building these things, uh, changing all of that stuff around, um, unless you really know what you're doing, you're probably going to create more problems than it's worth. Um, I've yet to shoot any weight of a 300 blackout bullet, whether it's subsonic or supersonic, out of a standard uh, phosphate, nitride, or nickel boron bolt carrier group and had any problems. I use a standard low profile gas block. Um, I just don't see that changing those components is going to do anything really to enhance the performance of the of the weapon. Um, we got another question about chambering an AR pistol in your 10 millimeter uh, 45 ACP or 40 S and W. Um, again, this is just going to be my opinion, and there, you know, there's going to be many different opinions about this. Um, me personally, I believe that if you're going to have a package that's that big, you put a rifle bullet in it. Um, I'm not a fan of building an uh, AR pistol to put a pistol round in it. Um, 
I know there's a lot of folks that don't agree with that, especially your pistol caliber uh, scorpion owning folks. That for me, if I'm gonna shoot a pistol round, I'll put it in a handgun. Um, if I'm gonna shoot an AR pistol, I'm gonna put a 556, a 223, a 308, a 300 blackout round in it. Um, absolutely nothing wrong with doing that, but um, that's just again my personal take on it. Uh, the last question we got was the, the bullpup style weapon versus a standard AR pistol. So um, what the bullpup, now let me go back kind of define it. Bullpup is basically a, a type of firearm where the action, the chamber if you will, is behind the trigger um, instead of above it or in front of it. So it, it kind of sh can shorten the gun so the action is in the stock and the back end of the gun. Um, the bullpup will get you around having to do the NFA paperwork um, because you're going to be making the design of the gun is, is just short because the action is put into the rear of the gun um, to where it's really longer if you move the action forward. So what you're really doing is just you're getting around having to do an NFA paperwork item. But um, what I would offer to you is this. If you're used to using an M4 and all the controls that you're used to using with an M4 they are not going to be in the same position in a bullpup type gun. Um, still a great, you know, there's nothing wrong with bullpup guns. It's just that they're not going to be as familiar and transitioning between the two is going to be very difficult because you're going to have your magazine release, your bulk, all that stuff is going to be in a different location. Um, so is one better than the other? Yeah, not really. Um, they're both creating a short package. If you just wanted to have a stock on a weapon and not do the NFA paperwork, you can get a bullpup gun. Just keep in mind, you're still really having a, a, a rifle. It's just the design makes it look smaller. Um, the AR pistol is truly a shorter barrel with a brace on the back of it. Um, so I guess in the end, you know, there's not really a personal preference in my case for either one. Um, but that's it for today. Um, we want to thank everyone for tuning in today. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. Remember, we are now the Triangle North Carolina Gun Club. We are the NAGA chapter for the Triangle area, and we are excited to have all of you here. We are going to continue to try and pull together and meet as a club once this corona thing is gone. Um, we typically meet at Eagle One, which is in Raleigh. It's our home range on the third Saturday of every month at 1030. Once the Corona stuff is gone, we'll be back in person. Until then, we'll try our best to continue to give you um, some type of engagement virtually. Uh, if there's something that you want to hear about, whether it's more stuff about the AR platform or long distance rifles or optics or products or anything you want to know about, please give us that feedback because we, we're here for you guys. We, we are here to build this chapter to give you the information that you want to get. Um, we have a lot of expertise in our chapter and we'd be happy to, to get that education and that information out to you. So if there's something that uh, you really want to know about, please hit one of the leadership team members up. Um, while I'm at that, let me give a roll call to working with the greatest team out there. Uh, Delon Fletcher is our IT guy that keeps us straight with all these productions that we're doing. Uh, Joy Allen, Reginald Roundtree, Kevin Bond, Al Dorlins, and again, I'm Kendrick Scott. I am the chapter president, and again, we want to hear from you. Please reach out to one of us and let us know. Thanks for attending today, and we'll see you next time.